Thank you so much, Grace. And thank you to everybody for having me today. Um, I'm going to try to tell you about an 18 to 20 year story in, in less than 15 minutes. So bear with me. If I talk fast, um, I, I apologize. But we'll go to the first slide. And, and I just wanted to share with you my personal story, because one would say I spent 14 years as the president and CEO of MassBio, which arguably is the well, Massachusetts really has become the best place in the world for innovation. How does somebody who's not a medical doctor, not a scientist, become the head of you know, this wonderful trade association whose mission was to drive innovation, create an ecosystem for innovation so that really smart people could solve unmet medical need, right? So let me go back to the beginning. I never, ever, ever, ever thought that I would work in the biotech industry. I never, ever, ever thought that uh, I would have a reason to. I graduated from a Merchant Marine Academy and I immediately started working at a company that uh, is now the largest environmental services company in North America. I got on, on the ground floor and while I was working at Clean Harbors Environmental Services, uh, I, I had a love for politics. And let me tell you real quick uh, how such a young person develops a love for politics here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Well, my dad was a politician and he was a selectman in the town that we grew up in for many, many years. So while I was very young, I was only 19 at the time and still a cadet at the Maritime Academy, uh, Merchant Marine Academy, uh, because I got involved in student government at the academy. My senior year, when everybody else was shipping out on merchant marine ships, I was rec I was representing as the student member of the Board of Regents of Higher Education here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I was representing the 29 colleges and universities, so I couldn't leave for three months out at sea. So while I was home, my dad said, why don't you run for school committee in the town. You got a good little resume. You probably won't win, but it'll be good experience. So at the age of 19, I, I ran for the school committee in the town of Dedham and I won. Keep in mind, folks, there was no social media back then. There wasn't any way. I, everyone thought they were voting for my dad. Okay, I'll, I'll admit it. But that's how I got elected when I was 19 years old graduated from the academy, started working at Clean Harbors, and wanted to further my political career. So at the age of 22, I ran to be a member of the select board uh, in the town of Dedham. And again, I, I was elected. And, and really, when you look at this picture here, where I really start to tell our story, you know, when I was 25, uh, I married the woman in the picture. I'm still married, happy to announce that I'm still married to her today. She's a saint. And, uh, you know, I, I really really developed a love of, I got elected to the Board of Selectmen, got married, had two beautiful, healthy kids. And, you know, at the age of 30, I decided that I wanted to do more in the body politic, retired from Clean Harbors and decided that I was going to be a politician and ultimately grow up. And when I grew up, become the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or maybe a U.S. senator, or who knows, maybe even president of the United States, right? The future was so bright. And if you look in this picture, you can see that my beautiful wife, uh, she had a belly going there. She was, you know, she was about 21 weeks pregnant um, with our third child. And again, back then, I thought that was such great news because as a, you know, egotistical politician, we all knew that when you had a picture of mom being pregnant, right, that was probably worth another 10% of the votes. So we were exciting. Life was good. That was us cutting the ribbon to our campaign headquarters. And um, Mary Kate's that little girl with the attitude with, she kind of had a boy's regular haircut back then too. I probably brought her the same barber I was going to. Mary Kate now, believe it or not, is going for her doctorate. She's going to be a scientist. So she is a scientist and, and she's 24 years old. I couldn't be more proud of her. Uh, and a shout out today is International Women's Day. So thank you to all you amazing women that are out there making the changes, uh, positive changes in, in the world and, the, and, and especially for patients. Mary Kate's an amazing young scientist. And then Paul, that miserable looking kid in the coveralls there, he's actually 21 years old. He's six foot five and he's actually attending the same academy uh, that I went to and I couldn't be more proud of him as well. But that baby, that baby that's in mom's belly, is the one that really changed the trajectory of where our lives were going because we found out at 21 weeks that that baby in utero 
was going to have cystic fibrosis. And it's a long story. It wasn't a standard pre-screen pre test for pregnant women when we were pregnant with Mary Kate, when we were pregnant with Paul. But for Christine, her OBGYN, it was a new screen. We found out that she was a carrier of the cystic fibrosis mutation. Weeks went by, they pushed me. I found out I was a carrier. We did an amnio and we were one of the first people in the country to be diagnosed in utero with a baby that was going to have cystic fibrosis. You can only imagine what that does to what it means, right? We were basically told we're going to have a baby in a few months or several months that is going to have a disease of which there's no cure and the life expectancy isn't great. And the irony behind it, and this is really difficult to explain, guys, and this is why I, I, I believe in the universe throwing you what, what, what you can take, because ironically enough, when I was chairman of the Board of Selectmen, before I was married, before we had kids, I became the chair of the Cystic Fibrosis Great Strides Walk in my town because a gentleman, a dear friend of mine that I played hockey with in high school, had two kids with CF, and my brother John, whose number is six boys. I'm the youngest of six boys. Johnny's number four. He married into a family that had three little kids with cystic fibrosis. I didn't even know what CF was at the time. I thought it was more like cerebral palsy at the time. And I agreed to take on the honorary chair role so that we could raise money. I raised over, you know, over $100,000 for cystic fibrosis research before I even was married or had kids. So the long and short of it is I was familiar with the disease by the time this happened. People in the CF community thought that we always knew we were carriers. That's why I got involved. The irony was it wasn't. So that being said, I had to make a decision. Do I continue to run for the House of Representatives or do I go back to my job where I was earning a good living and provide for my family? Well, I quickly learned from people like Jim Mandel, who is chairman or who is president of Boston Children's Hospital, and Bob Bell, who is the CEO of the cystic fibrosis at the time, and my dear friend Joe O'Donnell, who lost his son to cystic fibrosis, but he established the Joey Fund to raise money for cystic fibrosis research. They said, no, Bob, you should get into government because government plays a major role in creating an environment so that people can cure disease and solve unmet medical need. And a light bulb went off. And we decided that our role as a family was going to be to try to positively affect statute, legislation, statute, ordinances, bylaws, whatever it was in government, so that people like Josh Boger, who was the founder of Vertex, and Henry Tamir, who was at Genzyme at the time, and Mark Levin was at Millennium Pharmaceuticals at the time, and, 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 and you know, Biogen was a major player. There weren't too many biotech companies all the way back then in Massachusetts, but we knew that Massachusetts government needed to step up and do a better job. So while serving in the legislature, I did two things. One, I focused on educating my colleagues on how important good government was for innovation. And two, how can I work with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to raise money to invest in our pipeline of innovation? And before I go to the next slide, I just want to share a very sobering part of this story. When Bobby was born on May 1st, 18 years ago, Joe O'Donnell met me in the lobby of Boston Children's Hospital and he said, hey, kid, um, we're going to go out. I was a, significantly younger back then. He said, we're going to go out and raise $100 million. And the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is led by, as you know, Bob Bell, who's brilliant. And we're going to embark down a road called venture philanthropy. And venture philanthropy means that we're going to convince high net worth individuals to invest in our fund that will then invest in our own pipeline of therapies because we got to buy a cure. We'll raise $100 million and we'll buy a medicine so that your kid doesn't die like my kid did. My kid was only three or four days old at the time. Okay, think of how sobering that is. I thought doctors and scientists just cured diseases. I didn't know you had to go buy it. I didn't know someone had to be an advocate for it. I didn't know that people had to raise money to pay for it. What an opening, eye-opening experience it was. So then if you go to the next slide, Melvin, please you'll see that I decided to get involved with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This is one of the countless CF walks that we participated in. As you can see, Bobby's um, the CEO, that was him when he was about, I don't know, six or seven years old. He was the, and kids with CF have this raspy voice. He'd refer to himself as Bobby Coughlin, the CEO 
of Bobby's Brigade. So Bobby's Brigade went on to raise tens of millions of dollars for CF research. I got together with Joe O'Donnell and we did a capital campaign. And the long and short of it, we, we raised close to $500 million to invest in our own pipeline with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I learned what venture philanthropy was. I learned that the you know, the idea of taking on average of 10 years and a billion dollars to if you're one of the 1000 drugs or whatever that are companies that are successful to invent a drug to see how Bobby was in six clinical trials before he was even six years old. And, you know, I just realized the system wasn't very efficient. It didn't work very well. The drug, the, the drug discovery process was hard. And I found myself getting more and more depressed, the more and more I learned, because I really quickly realized, I realized that the likelihood of him getting a cure before, or a cure or a therapy being developed for him before he died was highly unlikely. This disease hit him very aggressively. You know, as we speak today, he's he's been battling, uh, you know, cystic fibrosis related liver disease. He needs a liver transplant now. His lungs scarring began at an early age. He, he, he pseudomonas got in him when he was young and we had trouble getting rid of it. And it was just, he had a tough go of it. And on the same situation, those three kids that my the family my brother John married into, they all died at 16, 18, and 21. And that was all in the last 15 years. So here, this my, my kids had these cousins of theirs that were dying from this disease that Bobby had. It was, it was just tough. It was horrible. So I decided in 07 that I would leave the legislature because I felt that there could be more done, not only to help my kid, but to help everybody who is experiencing unmet medical need. And I talk about juvenile diabetes, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Dravet's disease, and everything from Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and, 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 and all these even more prevalent unmet medical needs. If I could go out there and work for a company or an organization like MassBio, blow it up, rebuild it, and really position Massachusetts to become the best place in the world for innovation, maybe that would give a better chance of having my kid live longer than me, all right? So this stuff got personal. And if you go to the next slide, Melvin, um, not I, I left the legislature and I, I really talk about how progress is personal. And I joined MassBio on, uh, it was September 1st, 2007. You know, things didn't look great for Bobby at the time. So the only way I could keep from, you know, spiraling into depression or alcoholism or whatever, I had to get up every day and go do something that would help my kid not die. And by working at MassBio and getting the, the recipe for success for Massachusetts was simple, folks. And I'm not here to give a commercial for Massachusetts, but we became the best place in the world for innovation because... We already had academia, 122 colleges and universities crushing it. We had five of the top six NIH funded hospitals crushing it. So we had the academia piece. We had the critical mass of companies. It wasn't just the six founding members of MassBio anymore. There were about 300 biotech companies in 07. We then were able to take academia, industry and government all working together. And that's what it took. We created a billion dollar 10 year life science initiative. Now we're on the second five year half a billion dollar initiative. You know, this was a uh, an article that was on the front page of the Boston Globe on January 1st, 2009, where I was basically saying, you know, enough is enough. I don't want to hear people talking about drugs being too expensive. I want to hear people talking about what the costs are that are avoided through wellness. What do we got to do to take our sick care system and blow it up and turn it into a healthcare system. We're not just talking about drugs that treat symptoms of disease. We have drugs that change uh, the course of disease by treating the underlying cause of the disease. We have gene therapy and precision med medicine, cell and gene therapy that's actually curing disease now. And we don't have a healthcare system that can absorb those upfront costs. You wanna tell me that these drugs for kids with CF are too expensive because they cost 350 or $320,000 a year? Well, it took 18 years and in thirteen billion dollars to invent a drug that's only working for that works for only thirty thousand patients in the U.S. And he already cost a half a million dollars a year in hospitalizations by keeping them well and keeping them out of the hospital. We save money, but that's not how payers account for it. So there's a lot going on here, ladies and gentlemen. But because of the amount of money that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in, invested into our own pipeline. And because of when companies like Vertex acquire Aurora, instead of Aurora 
and Vertex giving up on their CF pipeline. The CF Foundation was able to fund it and double down and incentivize companies like Vertex, FoldRx, Combinatorics, Epics, Altus, El Nylum, El Nara, PTC, and, and many, many more to do cystic fibrosis research by making these early stage investments, by limiting risk, by taking on some of that early stage risk. We were able to, and you know, I'm gonna go to the next slide because I have to wrap up here soon and you can tell guys I'll go forever on this topic. But if you look at the next slide, Melvin, you will see that this is why I do what I do. This picture was taken on November 8th, 2019, and he's holding Trikaftin. Now keep in mind, he's only got one copy of the Delta 508 mutation. Uh, Mama uh, Christine passed off a 1313 minus one. And, and, you know, uh, don't take this the wrong way. In my family, we do genetic jokes. I know you guys understand it and everything. But the reality is, you know, I'd always say, Christine, it's your fault. We're not going to get a drug because your mutation is way too screwed up for any medicine to work. I'm joking. But that's why we were doubling down on gene therapy. I never thought that CFTR modulators were going to work for Bobby. So we've been doubling down on gene therapy. And I'm not willing to stop with this drug either. And the CF Foundation isn't going to stop until CF stands for cure for they're all in for CF. There's still 10% of the population that doesn't have a drug that treats the underlying cause of the disease. We're not giving up until they all have a medicine. But let me tell you guys, because you're what I call the wicked smart people that made all this happen. I'm not. I, I feel a different role and, and people like me feel a different role, but it takes all of us to achieve this sort of success. Because if you think about it, he's got one copy of the Delta 508 mutation and these people figured out a way to invent a small molecule drug, a pill that's literally gonna buy us enough time to come up with a cure. It's gonna buy us enough time. I don't have nightmares about him dying before me anymore. And I'll tell you, since this picture has been taken, I gotta show you another one from just last week. He's grown five inches. He has gained 25 pounds and his lung function has gone back up to 100%. The last time he blew PFTs of 100% was when he was 10 years old and he hasn't been in the hospital once and he's nailed getting through COVID in a way that I'm so proud of him. So if you think about why I do what I do, it's the same reason why all of you do what you do. And I can't thank you enough because this is what patient advocacy is all about. This is what... Um, Venture philanthropy is all about. This is what disease foundations are all about. It's not just the CF Foundation anymore. Look at what you know Michael J. Fox is doing. Look what Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy is doing. I will talk to anyone in the world. I meet with parents all over the world to talk about parent-powered innovation. If we don't go raise money and invest in our own early stage research and identify mutations and help fund research moving forward, no one else is going to do it for our kids. I love doing it. Why did I leave Mass Bio? Because it was time. I was there for 14 years. This little kid it's going to live. I'm taking a step back and I'm advising companies in real estate now so that they can focus on research and development. Let me find a location. Let me negotiate tax incentives. Let our firm do what we can do. And it's time for Mass Bio to just have a different point of view. I did it for 14 years. I miss it every day. Uh, as you can tell, it was a labor of love and a passion. But I, I got to stop right now because my time's up. I look forward to uh, spending more time with you guys and answering questions during the panel. Back to you, Grace. I'm sorry. I could have kept going. Thank you, Bob, so much. We always enjoy hearing from you, your passion and leadership in showing a way to tackle an incredibly difficult disease is an inspiration for all patient advocates and everybody, all stakers and stakeholders involved. So thank you so much, Bob. And, and I know thank we'll you. get back to more chance for questions and discussion in a little while.